Hello and welcome to our postgraduate virtual talk series. My name is Patrick Cosgrove and in our session this evening, I'll be joined by Dr. Amy Healy, who is the acting coordinator of doctoral programmes. And Dr. Healy will be focusing on fees, application procedures, scholarships and other funding sources here at MIC. So please remember that this session will be recorded, so you'll be able to look at it in the coming days. It will be up on our website at uh, postgraduate uh, virtual events. So if you want to look back at some of the uh, slides or any uh, other piece of information, you'll be free to do so. And um, I now hand you over to uh, Dr. Healy. Oh, and one other thing before we go, just, if, if you do have any questions, uh, please use the Q&A facility at, and uh, I'll be able to put them to Dr. Healy at the end of her presentation. So I'll now hand you over to Dr. Healy and she can start her presentation. Well, thank you very much, Pat, and thanks so much for joining me this evening. As Pat said, I am Dr. Amy Healy. I'm the acting coordinator of doctoral programs at MIC, and I've been asked this evening to talk to you about a little bit about the admissions process, although I, I heard that you heard about that last week, and that's been recorded, but I'll go, th I'll go through it briefly for those of you who weren't with us last week. I'll talk through various funding opportunities, both through MIC and external funds, that are, are, are regular, I won't say regular suppliers, but we have had many MIC um, students uh, receive them. And I'll go briefly through fees at the end, although all programs are different, so it is really important to go to the website. As Pat said, we will have a question and answer session at the end. Um, if for some reason I talk too long though and I don't get to your question, please do get in touch either through the RGSO at mic.ul.ie or you can write to me directly at amy.healy at mic.ul.ie. So tonight, as I said, I'm going to talk a little bit about application. I guess I've gone through this all. So James, if you wouldn't mind, we can go on to the next slide. Okay. Now, anything you really want to know about postgraduate programs, applying for postgraduate pro programs, and funding can be found on the MIC website. So we strongly encourage you to start there. And actually, even finding out about programs and how to, be, how to apply, you can access through a variety of pages, um, via faculty pages, via the research and graduate school. And as you can see, there's a little square that's circled there that's, that's research programs. And as you can see, it'll take you to this slide where you can enter information of interest to you. So you can enter keywords, let's say you're interested in English or history or theology, um, whether it's in the Faculty of Arts, if you want to look at all those programs generally, or the Faculty of Education. Uh, specify postgraduate degree if you're interested in, in doing a postgraduate degree and then obviously uh, you can either specify MIC Limerick or MIC Thurlis. Alternatively, if you click on another link on the home page of the MIC website, study at MIC, it will take you to a list where again you can click on postgraduate and go through similar processes and it will again take you to the slide that we were just at, um, or you can go to research and you'll find out information about the research and graduate school, which is where I work, top programs and research programs. So as you can see, the MIC website has um, quite a bit of information on what's available there and you can find information about postgraduate, both research and top programs through a variety of sources. Now, once you click on a, on a particular program, this one, for instance, is the MA in History, the website will take you directly to a page that will give you some information. This also has a video where a lecturer will talk to you through some of the, the strong points of the, of the program. And as you can see, circled on the screen is how to apply. Now you'll find that on all the, all the programs. So every time you go into MA or PhD in a specific program, there will be a, uh, a menu and you can click on how to apply. For top programs, I would suggest if you are interested that initially you do get in touch with the course leader and verify that the program's running in September for forthcoming academic year. Um, I think most of them are, but it's always good to know, but it's also a good idea to get in touch with the course leader. It's nice to have that kind of um, contact if you're thinking of, of applying. 
Now, just to be just to remind you, there's an application form. Now they're different. You have to make sure you do the one for the top post postgraduate programs if you want to do a top postgraduate program and return it to top programs at MIC. And just to be clear that the dates can vary. So you'll, you'll need to look at the particular website for the program you're interested in and make sure that you meet their deadlines. Some are May, some are June, some are July. So just, you know, if you look at one, let's say MA in history, but you decide you want to do something a little bit different, uh, just so you know, they may have slightly different, different deadlines. Um, and that's that's just what the application form looks like. And it, it goes through all kind of the basic information that you'd imagine, you know, your, your past education, um, work experiences if you had, any types of activities that might be relevant to you being a postgraduate student. Um, I know this sounds, uh, you know, publications, maybe not, but maybe you've participated in some types of conferences or things that are relevant to what you want to study. So make sure that you put your best foot forward and include everything you think someone would want to know about you as a postgraduate. Now you can also do a master's degree or PhD by research, which is a by thesis. Um, and this is a little bit different. It isn't just kind of filling out an application form. You actually have to think through about the program. Um, you know what you actually want to study because when you do a master's or a PhD um, by research you're you're doing your own research you're, you're finding a research topic or area that's of interest to you that you want to spend two to four years on so it's a question or a problem that you would like to seek and to address in your thesis um so you know that's that's kind of a big step um it can be helpful if you have a general idea of an area you're interested in to get on the MIC website and start looking through. I know the postgraduate prospectus lists all the, the different programs and also faculty um, interests. So if there is a particular thing that you would like to study in history or in English lit, um, theology, it's interesting or philosophy, it's interesting to know what faculty have, have studied themselves so that maybe you can find a match and talk through with that person, you know, how you could further pursue your research interests. Uh, but just so you know, the application process cannot proceed until a member of faculty has agreed to act as your supervisor. So that's key. And you should ask them to help you along the way. You know, once you are getting ready to, to put together a proposal, that person hopefully will, will, will give you some guidelines on how to proceed. So part of your application is a 3,000 to 4,000 word proposal. So it'll have a title, it'll include aims and objectives, the motivation you have for doing this type of research. General idea, now I, I, nobody expects you to have everything um, set in stone, but you, you know, a general idea of the methods you'd use to do this type of research and, and an outline of the project. Um, so obviously to get a, a PhD, you have to do something original, creative, um, something that hasn't been done before, so that's, one of the things that people assessing your application will be looking for. And um, as I said, the supervisor, your would-be supervisor should be able to guide you a little bit on that as well. Um, some things, some types of research have ethical implications. So if you think you'll be gathering data from people, you know, if you want to do a survey, if you want to do interviews, if you want to do action research within a classroom, you will have to go through an ethics process through Myrick, so it's just showing that you've thought through the ethical implications of your research. Um, as I said, you're you're just beginning, so don't let this don't let this scare you. But I mean, it is it is it's kind of a big project, so it's, it's well worth thinking about. And then obviously some type of a bibli bibliography to show that you have some sense of the field that you are about to get into. Now. What you do instead, now with the other application you sent it to top programs at mic.ul.ie. Instead, with a master's degree by research, uh, which is a thesis degree, um, you have an application package. So it includes your proposal. Um, you'll need two academic letters of reference. You'll need transcripts from all the, the other academic programs you've completed and your CV plus the application fee, and you send this all to the RGSO. Uh, so that's the research office where I work, rgso at mic.ul.ie. It will need to be signed by you, by your supervisor, and by head of department. 
And that's our way of knowing that you've communicated with everybody who needs to know that you're thinking of coming to MIC. So it's not meant to be scary. It's really just meant to make sure everybody is aware of what you'd like to do and that you're on your way. Um, next slide, please. Now the process is then uh, once a month, I sit on this committee, it's postgraduate research subcommittee. So the Dean of Education, the Dean of Arts, the Vice President of Research, soon to be replaced by the Graduate School Director. And um, we just all meet and make sure and everybody then yeah, we go through the application. So it's done on a monthly basis. Um, generally, uh, rest assured, if your head of department has signed off on your application, uh, you're pretty clear to get through, but I suppose everyone just, it's a final check to make sure that all the I's are dotted, T's crossed, and that you, you know, you have the qualifications you need and that you have the support, you know, so to make sure that if you're doing something very specialist, that your supervisor will be able to help you. Sometimes there might be a suggestion of another supervisor if it's a specific area where, you know, maybe you might be doing something that's interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary. I mean, we have academic experts at, on both campuses. So it's really just to make sure um, you're set before you before you join us. And as I said, it meets monthly after decisions are made, you would get a formal letter of offer, it goes to successful applicants and you are invited to register. Uh, next slide, please. But you might be wondering in all of this is how I'm going to pay for this. Um, and MIC does offer funding support schemes to help you along the way. Um, James, the next, it's not a slide, it's just a line, okay. For those of you who have been at MIC and excelled as an undergraduate, there are some achievement awards that you might be offered when you graduate, and um, James. There are also other MIC postgraduate awards that I will talk you through. Sports scholarship for elite athletes, there's conference fund support. So I'll talk through all of these and also external funding opportunities. So there's lots of different ways to think about funding your education. So I'll give you an overview of all of those. Thanks, James. Next slide. So specifically, if you've been at MIC already and you've excelled, there's the President's Scholarship, um, the Kieran Burke Memorial Award, uh, Patter Kremen Fellowship, and I'll talk through those individually, James. So the President's Scholarship is awarded to students who receive a first class honors in their undergraduate degree or in their grad dip in education. So it gives um, excellent students an opportunity to pursue postgraduate study in, in MIC, um, either at a graduate diploma, a top master's or a research master's uh, with a fee reduction for one to two years, you know, depending on how long it takes for you to complete your, your program. The annual fee reduction for the post for the president's postgraduate scholarship is 1500. Now there is also there's a student students who achieve first place in undergraduate programs are awarded gold medals. Uh, those students are given a 3000 euro waiver in fees. Um, so you can use that for two years, as I said, one to two years. Um, if you transfer to a PhD program from your master's, uh, the president's scholarship will go towards the first two years of study. Um, and just so you know, I mean, some people are offered this, they're not sure if they want to do postgraduate study. Um, the offer does extend for three years after your offer, so it, it gives you a chance to think about it and decide before you take up that offer. Next slide, please. The Kieran Burke Memorial Award is for first class honors graduate from Bachelor in Education. Uh, be at an education in psychology with the highest cumulative QPV. It's a waiver of fees and tuition charges together with a bursary of 6,900 per year. So that's quite, um, quite generous. Um, and I suppose I should say it's a, instead of a waiver, it's a contribution. It's a contribution towards kind of normal fees, which are around 4,400 for an EU citizen and 8,700 for a non-EU uh, citizen. So it won't cover the full cost of some of the professional doctorate, the doctorate of DEXI, for instance, in education psychology. And it can be used for two consecutive years on one program. James, the next slide. There's also the Patter Kremen Fellowship is first class honors B. Ed graduate on the basis of their QPV and designated modules and an independent review of the final year dissertation. Um, so students must have achieved an average QPV equivalent to grade A1 in their research methods and dissertation modules. And again, there's a contribution 
to fees with a bursary of 6,900 per year. And again, applicable to any individual for two consecutive years on one program only. So for there are some programs, DEXI, which is a professional doctorate in, in education and psychology does cost more than the average um, fees charged at, at MIC, but it would be a contribution towards those fees. Uh, for those of you who didn't attend MIC or uh, or did but didn't weren't offered those awards there are other ways of getting funding to do postgraduate study at MIC so I will go through these each individually um, James we can move to the next slide um, there are what we call departmental assistantships which are awarded by individual departments which again is a contribution towards fees of 4403 for EU citizens 8781 for non-EU citizens and a stipend of 6900 per year and I'll go through the particular duties um, when I I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more in depth in the next slide but for now just to say um, if you're interested in a particular program and you you know it's it's worthwhile getting in touch with the head of the department to ask them about their departmental assistant program. Um, you can get really great academic experience as well as as you know becoming I've, I've talked to some of the the DAs this year. Um, COVID's been a bit isolating so they've said it's been a great way to meet people and feel part of the department so highly recommended. Um, there are other words that we call kind of merit awards and I'll go through these as well. One is a doctoral award which as you can see a contribution to its fees plus 12,600 per annum. So that's that's quite a quite a nice award. The doctoral studentship, which is a contribution to awards and 6,900 per annum. And then a postgraduate studentship, which can either go to a master's student or a doctoral student. The deadline for those is coming up. It is April 1st. So uh, if you're an excellent student, um, and you'd like to receive supports, I would highly recommend putting your name forward. And it's just one application for all three. You just tick a box for all of them. It's up on our website and I'll talk about it a bit more on one of the next slides. So James, if you could go on to the next slide, please. So as I said, I was going to talk to you a little bit more about departmental assistantships. Um, Departmental assistantships are, are merit based as well. I mean, they, you know, if there are 100 applicants to a department, they're not all going to get DAs. Some departments do take on more than one DA a year. Every department can take on at least one additional DA every year. And what a departmental assistant does is they assist, as, just as it sounds like. You are, I suppose, obliged is the word to provide up to um, a maximum of 120 hours of assistance to your home academic department across the academic year. So that averages about five hours a week. And you can't exceed 10 hours in any given week because really the whole point of you being here is so that you progress on your research, not so that you work um, nonstop for the department, but as I said, it is a great opportunity. And I know um, the DAs who do it really enjoy it. So it might mean tutoring. Um, and now it's online, so they're all getting experience of teaching um, virtually, which is great. Um, you might help the lecturer prepare for tutors, to, to, <laughs> tutoring seminars, workshops, or provide assistance. Um, you might be asked to sit in and record um, or do supplementary lecture, seminar, workshop activities. Um, if there's someone in your department who needs assistance with their research, you might be asked to do field work and assistance with activities. And also um, I do, well, part of my remit is to provide training and transferable skills. So we offer training once a week. We have a webinar where we might talk about things like academic learning, um, the academic interview, uh, research integrity, all those things. So you might be encouraged to both attend those and also lead our Learning Enhancement and Academic Development Center. Does an awful lot in providing you um, training in how to teach and how to do things virtually online. So you gain valuable skills in using things like Moodle and Blue Button. So um, it's just a great opportunity if, and it makes you, as a, as a student said, it really makes you feel like you're part of the department and you get to know people and you get to know incoming students. Um, 
So that's, a, that's I, I did a lot of that kind of work when I was getting my PhD and it, it, it is a great way to feel part of what's going on. Next slide, James. Now, uh, the departmental assistantships, as I said, each department runs the competition themselves. So you have to, you have to get in touch with the head of department if you are interested um, and they'll give you information. And James, next slide. I've just done a screenshot of history because his history department was the first one to put up their DA information for this year. Um, so if you can see it under their useful information on their website, um, they're saying that applications are now open. Um, and it actually should be for next year. So it should be for 21-22. But if you do click on the link, um, it will take you to a couple page document which tells you what they expect out of their DAs and also what they expect out of your application. And part of the application is what you feel you would bring to the role, you know, how you would be helpful um, in either helping with teaching or the other possible skills that an assistant might be asked to provide. So you have to sell yourself a bit, but it's, it's, it's I suppose you're applying for a job in a way, and it also gives you um, a fee waiver really, because uh, it, it is a fee waiver that covers the fees for most um, research awards. I'll go through, there's a few at the end that are slightly different. So um, that's the DAs. I'll go on now, James, to the other types of supports. As I said, we offer merit awards, um, a doctoral award, a doctoral studentship, and a postgraduate studentship. And these are a little bit different in that you're, these, this, they're not jobs as such, so you don't get taxed on these. Um, these are just grants, really, um, that are meant to support you in your study. So it's very nice. These are for excellent students. It's giving them an opportunity, you know, not to worry as much about money and just to focus on their, their studies. Um, you're not required to perform any duties for the department, the faculty or the college in general. However, if you wish to gain experience, you, you can, I suppose, volunteer to perform some of the duties that a DA would provide within your academic department, but you're not allowed to do more than 48 hours per academic year. So just a couple hours a week, if you would like that experience, you know, the experience of, of doing a tutorial or helping on a research project, um, you would need the approval of your relevant dean. But so these are really excellent awards. Um, uh, they're meant to support, you know, students who, who have, uh, you know, very promising research proposals um, and ideas for their for their study at MIC. Next slide, James. So, uh, as I said, the application is coming up very quickly. Um, the time's going by very fast. I mean, we're already the 3rd of March and the deadline for these is the 1st of April. So there's about a month to get your portfolio together if you're interested. Um, and that they go to the research and graduate school. So the RGSO at mic.ul.ie. Um, and you can get all this information on, on MIC's website, but what you'll need is to complete the award application, which includes about a thousand word research proposal. You'll need references from two academic referees, um, confirmation of support from the relevant head of department at MIC, or course director of the professional doctorate in education and child psychology program as appropriate, and then transcripts of academic records. And as I said, really put, put your best foot forward. Um, you think of all the things that you've done that would make you a valuable candidate. Um, and as always, you know, maybe even get a friend or someone to read it through and remind you, you know, maybe of things that you've forgotten. And um, I would highly recommend doing this for everyone, because I think it's really great to start thinking of yourself in this way. If you're coming to MIC to do a master's or a doctoral study, um, part of being an academic in the academic world is getting used to putting your best foot forward, um, presenting yourself in your best light um, within the academic world. So this is a great way to start getting practice and um, if, uh, best of luck, I suppose. Um, Next slide, James. So as you can see, this is if we go to the MIC website, there's a page for scholarships, funding and fees. And if you scroll down on the page, you can see 
Um, there's more information on doctoral awards, um, studentship awards, departmental assistantships, um, there's application information, and then there's also information on other awards that are available at MIC. So this is a great place to go if you have any questions or if you want more information on anything that I've talked about this evening. Um, next slide, James. We can keep going. That's a circle of other awards. This is where you might find out about other things that are possible. And this year, um, Theology and Religious Studies has, I know I'm saying PhD scholarship, but they actually have um, five for next year. Um, and these are really generous. It's all part of, it's called the Grace Scholarship, um, Global Researchers Advancing Catholic Education. is an international-based partnership between MIC, Boston College, and the university, and I don't know if they say Notre Dame or Notre Dame in Australia, we'll go either way. Um, so it's really to support people uh, who are interested in studying and furthering Catholic education, and they're very generous um, scholarships. It's actually a DA plus a stipend, which comes in total to 20,000. So um, it's a fee waiver um, of about of 4,400 for, and then the, there's about 1,600, is it 1,600? No, about 1,400 on top of that stipend. So about double what you get as a usual DA. Um, but as I said, there's five. Um, and I know they're really interested in people looking onto their website. I've, I've included the information there, or you can get in touch with Professor Eamon Conway um, at, at the Theology and Religious Studies Department, and he'll give you more information. Um, next slide, please. Alternatively, for those of you who are elite athletes, there's a possibility of getting a, a MIC sports scholarship. These are two scholarships that are a memory of former MIC staff members, Noreen Lynch and Leonard Enright, and they're available for those who've excelled in their chosen sports. And there are actually a list of sports on the on the website that'll take you through. Um, so it's really for those of you who have, have gone that step beyond and continued in your sports, um, whether you're paying at the county level or rowing at the national level, whatever your sport is running, um, this might be for you. So definitely the deadline's May 1st, it's worth looking into. James, the next slide. Now this is for once you're here, so I don't know if it's really appropriate, but just you know, once you're here, we also provide funding for conference, um, not just attendance, but for presentations. Um, as I said, you know, once you enter the academic world, it's important that you start doing these things. You know, being a DA helps you get experience teaching and doing research. It's also important to get used to presenting and now it's all presenting virtually, but we do have postgraduates who are participating in online conferences and MIC is willing to help support that by paying for conference fees. Um, in the past, we also would have paid for things like travel uh, to get you to your conferences with COVID. That's not happening. Hopefully the world will open up again. But part of COVID, amazingly, it's been very interesting because we all can go to conferences all over the world from our, 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 our desk or our kitchen table. So it's been a wonderful time. Um, but just to say, I mean, every person, as long as we have money, um, can get up to 500 per annum for conference participation. So we really do want to support you as a researcher once you're here. Next slide, please. But there are also other places to find money. I suppose it's, I hope I haven't exhausted you all yet, but I mean, it's, it's important to keep your ears and eyes open because certain organizations, um, certain disciplines have their own scholarships and their own funding arrangements, and they're well worth looking into. Um, Twitter, academic Twitter, I don't know if any of you are on Twitter, but there's quite a slew of things that, that get advertised there. So if there's certain organizations that are associated with the field you want to study, I would suggest you start following them on Twitter, um, following uh, people in the field or get, you know, getting to know or other people, talking to people you know, historians, those are in English, I'm trying to think German, French, all the different, you know, there are there are many possibilities. Um, so part of it is just starting to look. It's amazing what you can find if you get on the internet for, for a half an hour or so. And I'll just take you through some of the basics. Okay, James, if you don't mind. 
There are some national funding bodies. Uh, I'll talk to you a little bit more about the Irish Research Council because we've had great success with their funding over the years. Um, for those of you who are teachers, there's the Teaching Council. Um, Fulbright is uh, is an organization that helps support people do academic exchanges with the United States. So that's probably something for when you actually get here. But as you can see, there's other organizations that provide funding. So if anything looks interesting, I just I would suggest clicking and doing a little bit of investigation. And I'll take you through some details of some now. So James, if you don't mind, next slide. Um, for international students, uh, this is another deadline that's coming up quickly. There's the Government of Ireland International Education Scholarship. As I said, it's for international students only. It can be used for either a taught or research postgraduate program, um, but you must first submit an application to MIC. So you should get in contact with Holly Kalman at mic.ul.ie. She's in the international office and she will be able to give you more information, but it is quite a nice award. Um, you're expected to act as an ambassador for your country and for Ireland, but it's a stipend of 10,000 and tuition for a year. So it's a really wonderful opportunity for those of you who'd like to come to Ireland for a year. Um, but as I said, the deadline's coming up. It's the 26th of March, so it's something you really need to act on now. Um, and I've given you the address there so you can click on to the website as well and get some more information. Um, next slide, James, thanks. The Irish Research Council Government of Ireland Postgraduate Scholarships are, are really wonderful scholarships. It's quite competitive, um, but it, it offers an awful lot of support. Now, the um, the application for next year is already over. This happens very early on. So I suppose it's something that if you're thinking of applying, um, as I said, it's competitive, I think, so maybe 18% success rate. Having said that, we had four at, at MIC last year. So um, uh, we were very successful. Uh, we had a few in arts and a few in education. So we have top level students who are getting support at a very high level from the Irish government. Um, and it can be applied to either a research master's or a PhD. So I suppose that's something to remember. A lot of these awards are for research, um, PhD and masters, although some can apply to top programs. The scholarship itself is a stipend of 18,500 per annum. It's not taxed, it's not work, it is actually a grant. Um, they'll contribute to your fees up to a maximum of 5,750 per year. And then they actually also allow you to do direct research expenses of 3,250. Now that says per annum, I don't know if it's per annum and per total, so sorry, that might be a typo. But that allows you to do things like buy a PC, um, travel if you need to once the world opens up with COVID to do data collection um, and other types of research expenses. Um, I know, you know, just thinking about it, I'm a quantitative sociologist. Back in the day, I actually had to buy data sets from certain governments. You know, it's those types of expenses, things that are directly applicable to your research. Within the RGSO, we will help you with the process. So it's not something that would be possible for you to get next year, but you'd have to start. I mean, once they open, there will be a call in September and you'll need to have everything ready to go by the end of October. So we really do tell people to start thinking about it now because it's a big application and it has to be perfect. And as I said, we're very happy to help. Um, I have helped students with their IRC applications in the past and Dr. Julianne Stack, our graduate school director, has gone through many successful iterations of the IRC program. So we're here to help with proposal writing, management, budgeting, impact statements, um, you name it. But there's lots of information on their website, so I would definitely recommend that you go there and have a look if it's something you're interested in applying for. And they do support all kinds of research. So it's not just that they're, you know, when you think about it, Irish Research Council, it's for all of Ireland. You know, they're not just going after STEM projects. They really do support the arts as well. So um, everyone really should think about applying for this program. Next slide, please. There are other types of awards out there. Um, the Kieran Berry Scholarship has not been called yet this year, so I don't have a lot of information on it. It's reserved for a student with disability undertaking a postgraduate degree. Um, so if you're interested, you should go to that uh, website address to see if they have put out a call for this year or not. 
If you're a teacher, if you're a member of Intu, there's uh, Intu Grant. Um, again, this one hasn't been called yet, but last year the closing date was September. So I imagine it's it's it will be coming out. Um, and last year we had two recipients at MIC, one doing a doctorate and one doing a master's. And they're great. They're they're bursaries. There's six bursaries, three thousand for a doctoral student and fifteen hundred for a master's. So that's a great um, contribution to your fees. Next slide, please. The Teaching Council also usually. Um, Actually, that's a great website, the Teaching Council, if you're a teacher, because not only do they talk about the John Coulihan Research Support Framework, although there's no call yet for next year, but they also give you information on all other different types of funds and supports that are out there across Ireland. So definitely, if you're studying education, um, that would be a, a place to go to look for external funding for your research project. ASTI, similar to um, into also has um, funding for their members. They provide a 2000 euro scholarship for those undertaking third level studies and beyond. Um, and their closing date is coming up very soon. It's March 31st. So as with all things, check their website. And next slide, please. And continue, let's see. <laughs> There we are, apply for everything. So I know it takes time, but certainly it's worth looking at and the returns can be great. So I, I highly recommend, um, you know, look around and don't be shy. Um, if you apply for one thing, it means you've put in the time and the energy and, and organize things in such a way that'll make it much easier to apply for other things as you go along. So it's a, it's, it's a good, thing to do is a good place to start because um, you'll always be able to use whatever information you put into your application into something else and if you're you know if you've excelled in the past and, and you've put forward a, a great proposal then fingers crossed you'll be successful and you'll be able to join us with support um, at MIC next year. Uh, next slide please. Now, I know I've been talking very quickly. I hope I haven't been talking too quickly. I don't think uh, my producers thought I'd get through all my slides so quickly, but I can talk very quickly. I've, and I've gone through things fast, so I hope I haven't confused anything. My last slides are just a few slides that take you through the costs for programs, both the taught postgraduate fees in arts and education, and then those through research. And as you can see, if you can see the screen, they vary quite a bit. So it depends. Um, it depends on whether you're doing um, a full time one year course, a part time two year course. So as you can see that the costs vary, you know, the full time course is going to cost more per year, but probably less overall than if you do a course part time over two years. Um, and I can't even give you a general average because they're all slightly different, aren't they? I mean, at the very low end, the grad cert in Christian leadership is 750 euro, but that is only, um, that meets a, a number of weekends over the year. So that's a slightly different course. At the other end is the MA in Applied Linguistics. So that's three consecutive semesters and thus um, at full time, it's, it's 6,425. As you can see, EU students pay about half of what non-EU students do for courses. You know, it's kind of a rule of thumb if you're trying to figure it out, but they do vary. So, you know, be careful and check. And this, as I said, is all on the MIC uh, UO website. So it's, you know, if you have a question, uh, the page I showed you before that looks at scholarship funding and fees has a tab for fees and you can go straight on and get all this information. Um, next slide, please. Who can even read this? It shows you how many different programs we have that are taught in education. And I'm sorry, without my glasses, I can't even read all these. But as you can see, um, there's a wide range of, of differences in, in how much things cost. At the upper end is a professional doctorate in educational and child psychology. Having said that, I, I believe applications for that are now closed for next year. So if that's something you're interested in, you might want to get in touch with Trace Brophy and talk about possibilities of joining the program later. Um, but they are. Uh, so as I said, as you can see, there is quite a difference. Some programs cost, you know, about 
somewhere between four and five grand a year, depending on on the program and then uh, professional doctorate in education and child psychology is, is over 10,000. Um, and it reflects um, resources and um, opportunities presented within that program. So as I said, I can't go through these all, and to be honest, I can't even read them all unless I squinted at the screen very closely, but do go onto the MIC website and, and have a closer look. Um, James, the next, the next slide, please. And then finally, research postgraduate program fees. We can all read this, this is bigger, um, and they're pretty standard across the board. Um, generally speaking, for an EU student, um, fees are 4,403. Um, as you can see, once you're doing a research degree, everyone is given full-time status, and there are no part-time research degrees as such, although, um, that is, I suppose, something you talk through with your supervisor. Um, for a master's through research, you're required to pay full course fees for two years. For a PhD, it's four. After that, you're asked to pay a continuance fee, you know, so if you're not able to finish within two years of a master's, you pay your full 4,403 euro if you're an EU resident um, for two years, and then after that, it's 500 euro per year per term until you go on to um, examination and finish. As before, um, charges for non-EU students are about double what they are for, for EU students. Um, and the supports that I talked you through, um, the fee waivers would provide fee waivers for those prog programs. Um, and I think I mentioned on last, the last slide, the structure of PhD in applied linguistics is a bit um, the first year is a bit higher, a bit more expensive um, based on how it's provided and the PhD in literacy education also is, is a little bit more expensive, but not much. So um, just to give you a sense with all those, you know, you, there is an expectation for an MA that you will be enrolled for the two years and for a PhD for four. Um, so I think I've jogged through this very quickly. James, is there a next slide? There might be a next slide. So there you are. Thanks for that. Um, if you have any more questions, you can ask me and Pat now. And I don't know if you've asked them yet. I'm quite happy to try to answer them. I'm relatively new at my role, so hopefully I'll be able to answer. Pat has offered to help. But if not, you can write to the RGSO at mic.ul.ie, or you can write to me and we will get you the answer that you need or refer you to the right place. So thanks so much. Um, we look forward to seeing you at MIC next year. Uh, thanks very much, Amy. I think that was a very detailed and comprehensive uh, presentation. You covered an awful lot there uh, in, in, in that presentation. So if anyone does have any questions, please do uh, submit them and we'll do our best to answer them. So we have a couple of questions already and uh, I might just put, the, uh, put them to you, uh, Amy. We've one from Yvonne and Yvonne, I think is talking about um, departmental assistantships and she was wondering, are the hours flexible? Would you be expected uh, to be available every day or could, or could you continue to work uh, three or four days a week and work your timetable around that rule? Well, Yvonne, what I'd say is, I mean, it's, it's getting in touch with the, the head of department because I think a DA means something different in every department. Um, there are people who juggle, obviously, school and other work commitments who are DAs, although that's hard because the most important thing is that you progress with your research. But certainly there is flexibility built in. So you would need to talk to the head of department about what your schedule looks like and your availability and find out what they need. Because certainly, you know, if you need to, to cover a tutorial that might not be as flexible as if you're helping let's say with some type of a research project so it really depends on what type of work you're doing but certainly um it's it's worth getting in touch with the head of department and 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 finding out more about the da is what i would say thanks for that thanks amy i think that's good advice uh, we have another question then and this person uh, it's really to do with the president uh, scholarship. They're wondering um, if they graduate with a 1-1 in, in their degree, are they guaranteed a president scholarship? You know, Pat, I think... Yeah, I, I would say, I suppose, 
nobody is probably guaranteed that in that you could be up against other students who also have um, a first class honours degree for that scholarship. But I, I suppose the short answer, it would give you a very good, um, I suppose if you'd have a good chance of getting it, but I suppose there's no guarantees. It, it, is, a, it is a competitive process. So I suppose that's probably the, 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 the long and the short answer to that question. Um, we have another one here, Amy. Uh, this person wants to know if you have previously graduated from MIC and now want to apply for a master's, do you have to provide your transcripts or does the college still have them? Well, the college does still have them, but you do have to provide. Uh, uh, I, I suppose what I would say to you is you're putting your best foot forward. So I would I would make sure that everything is to hand when your application is being um, is being reviewed. So you should make sure that the people who are reviewing your application actually have your transcript. So I would make sure that you provide that with your application, even though it seems a little bit redundant. Um, not everybody in MIC has access to all the same um, you know, not everyone can get onto the academic uh, computer, etc. So I would say yes, do provide your transcripts. Thanks, Amy. And, and I suppose if you are in any doubt, uh, I suppose your first port of call should be to the MIC admissions office. And if you can, if you want to, you can email them at admissions at mic.ul.ie and they'll uh, be able to point you in the right direction or as uh, provide that information for you. So uh, next question that we have, it's uh, specifically for someone they want to know for the MA in Leadership of Wellbeing and Education, are there postgraduate uh, studentship grants available? So that's one of our education programs. It is, and it's a taught one, isn't it? Hmm, yes. I'm not sure. The, the, um, the, the MIC postgraduate awards are definitely for research. Um, MAs and research PhDs. Um, I think DAs are generally as well. I mean, there are some programs, there are some PhDs that have a mixture of a taught and a research component, but there is that research component. So um, not the ones that I've spoken about. Pat, do you know of anything that I've missed? Um, I, I, I suppose off the top of my head, probably the best, I suppose really the best thing to do probably be to contact um, Dr. T.G. O'Callaghan uh, who is uh, head of the uh, education programs at the moment. So he might be the best person to con contact. That's um, would be tj.ocalic at mic.ul.ie. Or if you just look up the program page itself, there, there might be a little bit more information. But I think that's probably your best, uh, your first option anyway, get in touch with, with him and he may he might be able to provide a little bit more information. Well, certainly any of the undergraduate awards that I talked to you about would would go towards a, a taught master's. So, I mean, if you are an MIC graduate and you received any of those awards or the sports awards, any of those, they could be applied to a taught MA. So definitely if you're if you if you're finishing at MIC and you've done very well, there's a possibility you will get help. Yeah, thanks very much, Jamie. Um, next question then, I suppose just a general advice question, Amy. Um, just I suppose, what general advice would you give to someone who's preparing an application uh, at the moment for a postgraduate program in the college? Well, I suppose, I, you know, I think sometimes it can be just, there's loads of stuff online. So you might first just want to see if there's, I mean, there's some great advice on, on how to do things if you want basic guidelines. But I mean, it really is about presenting your best self. So it's like kind of looking back through your own. I don't know if you already have a CV. You may have had to prepare one um, for, for other work, but it's looking through critically at your own academic um, experiences, the highlights of your academics, um, and putting your best foot forward, as I said, um, thinking about any work experiences that you may have had that would complement what you'd like to do as a postgraduate. Um, and I think, you know, a key right now, is something that I've started, started doing when I was a student, is just keep track of everything, you know, so even now when you're getting ready, whenever you do something that might be relevant to an academic 
um, CV or to an application, make sure you write it down and keep it on file so that when you're doing things like this, you have it to hand. Because um, it's really making, it's so easy to forget things that might be relevant. You know, if you did something very interesting um, as when you were an undergraduate, if you did some volunteer work that's relevant. I mean, we don't always think of those types of things, but they can be very, very relevant. So even talking to your family and friends is useful. They might remember things about you that you've forgotten. And um, Pat, do you have any advice? Uh, no, I think that's that's great advice that you're after giving there, um, uh, Amy. I suppose yeah, really. I suppose the whole thing is to be prepared and kind of put in the work beforehand. Do your due diligence, as they say. That's probably the best thing. And talk to people, um, particularly any people in the college as well, that might be able to advise you or friends that have gone through the process already. You know, get as much information as you can. Uh, a follow-on question then to that, uh, Amy, you, you kind of mentioned it in your presentation anyway. Um, should you apply for numerous programs or should you just stick uh, to, to one if you're going to apply for a postgraduate course? Now, are you talking about numerate postgraduate courses? Well, as in, I suppose, what is, should you apply for a couple of different programs rather than just one um, program? Well, you certainly can. I mean, I, I think, you know, and uh, if there are some things that, you, if you have a variety of interests, you can certainly apply for more than one program, and then you can choose from from your successful applications. Sure, I mean some people are very focused and they only want to do one thing, so there might only be one thing that they want to do. But there, if there's a few things at MIC that you think you'd really like to pursue, well, you can. But I suppose what I would start with is talking to the course leader of all of those programs and make sure that each of those programs is, is what you think it is first. Uh, thanks, Amy. Uh, next question then is on the role of the supervisor. And I suppose for many people maybe coming for an undergraduate degree, uh, the concept of a supervisor might be a little bit alien to them. Uh, could you just maybe explain the whole concept and how the, the supervisor student relationship actually works, Amy? Okay, well, the supervisor, I suppose it's a, it's a person who's gone through the process themselves and um, probably helped other students through the process of, of doing a thesis. Um, so the whole process of, of planning a research project, organizing it, managing it, and then bringing it to fruition. So it's really an expert in your field who is your resource when you have questions and how to do things when to do things, um, what's expected out of you as a postgraduate student, what's expected out of a thesis. I mean, they really will guide you or should be able to guide you through the whole process of beginning your research project till the end. Now, obviously there are other people at MIC who will help you, the research office. We are here to help you. And there will be other faculty members who help you along the way. But your supervisor is really the one who helps you plan and map out how you do your research and make sure, you know, you need to make sure that you have all the necessary skills that you need to successfully um, complete your research. And sometimes that might include you getting outside training or getting training, specific training from another place. But it's all those things. It's making sure that, you know, when you come in with a research idea, that you have the ability um, to finish it successfully. And um, that's, you know, that's why it's important to pick out a supervisor who has knowledge in the field you're interested in. And it's, you know, it's a good idea to see what kind of publications they've put out, you know, quick view on Google Scholar or ResearchGate, you can find out about people. Um, but also the website, you know, most lectures will have information about themselves and they might have an academic CV up, uh, which will give you an information. Um, and what their interests are. But I mean, it, it, it's too hard. It would be too hard for someone to come in and try to do something like a research thesis without having an expert to guide them along the way. So that is the role of the supervisor. Thanks very much, Amy. Um, our time is uh, against us, so we might just take one or two more questions. Um, we have a question here. This person wants to know, are there interviews for a taught MA as well as applications? I suppose that's kind of a general question now. I suppose it really depends on the program, Amy, I presume, but it. Well, you might know better than I do, Pat. I, I could leave yeah, that to well, you, because I'm, I'm mostly in research, so I will leave that one to you. Yeah, so I, I'm thinking maybe of something like the Professional Masters of Education for, for primary teaching. There is an interview as part of the application process in that, but I suppose if it's a specific program, really, you should just check the website and just see 
uh, is there an interview uh, process involved as well? Really, is probably the best advice there. And uh, next question then, Amy, that we have, it's another follow up one. Uh, it's in relation to the uh, professional master of primary education that I was just talking about. This person wants to know, is it possible to do some part time work while undertaking the course? And I suppose this is applicable to any program. Really, Is it, is it possible to do part time work while undertaking the course? I suppose the key is and something I have always because I've lectured in the past as well is making sure that your work doesn't interfere with your coursework because taught, taught programs have taught classes that you need to attend. So it's figuring out a way of balancing those things because um, your education, your time at Mary, MIC will go very fast. So you want to make sure you don't miss those valuable teaching moments and moments where you can meet other people in your class. But, you know, there are ways of balancing things. So it's being a bit creative as well. And um, I'm, I'm seeing that we're running out of time. So did I answer that one effectively, Pat? Is that, is that good? Yeah, that, that, that's great, Amy. Yeah, and I think, as you said, the whole thing is about finding a balance really and, and a program like the Professional Masters of Education. It is a full time program as well. So, you know, you just need to, to find a balance and take all things into, into consideration. So our time is up. So I'd just like to thank um, Dr. Amy Healy for, for a very detailed presentation and all the information that she's given this evening. Um, please remember, if you do have any questions about our postgraduate programs, you can always go to our website if you want to look up mic.ie MIC postgraduate um, virtual events page. You can find out information about the programs and about different um, uh, postgraduate events that we're having. Uh, you can also use our online Q&A facility called Pubble on any of our program pages where you can ask a question and someone who works in the college will get back to you with an answer uh, to your query. Also, this session has been recorded, so if you missed anything or you want to look back over it in the future, uh, please remember that it will be available on our website. Just check out MIC postgraduate virtual events uh, and you'll be able to find it. So thanks again to Dr. Healy and thanks again for joining us this evening. That brings uh, this session to a conclusion. So just wish you all a very nice evening and thanks for joining us.